Thank you for taking part in this event and welcome to this talk about the domestication of plants and new discoveries about the first cereals in Britain. My name is Inez Lopez de Riga and I'm a doctor in prehistory and archaeology. I am the lead environmental archaeologist at Wessex Archaeology. My talk is going to focus in three themes. First, an introduction into plant domestication and archaeobotany a subdiscipline within environmental archaeology. Secondly, I will approach the different processes of domestication of plants in human history. This is a huge topic, so I will just touch some issues very broadly with a bit more detail into the spread of domestic cereals in Western Europe and prehistory. Thirdly, I will speak about some case studies that I have been able to work in at Wessex Archaeology that will provide interesting data for the research into the spread of domestic cereals in Britain in prehistory. So, um, what's domestication? Um, domestication is a process of morphological and genetic modification of plants produced by selection or human selection as a result of a certain way of using plants. So, for example, in cereals, domestication involves uh, morphological changes in the ear. These have to be manually broken down by threshing or dehusking, for example, or releasing the grains, as opposed to what happens naturally in the wild grasses, which have brittle rachises as part of the chaff, and the grains are released when they are mature, so they can germinate and produce a new plant without human intervention. So all of this sounds more like botany. Why me being an archaeologist? Why am I speaking about this? Uh, it's because there are two main sources of information to study plant domestication in the past. One is through the study of uh, living plants, modern plants, and their uh, genes. Uh, so it's, this is done by geneticists. And the other one is uh, through the study of archaeological evidence. And the archaeological evidence can be either direct, uh, such as the cereal grains themselves, and indirect. So, for example, uh, artifacts, ancient DNA, and other archaeobotanical remains. Um, I would like to explain that there are also different ways of doing archaeology, in some ways related and sometimes feeding into each other. So there is community archaeology, which starts uh, from site investigation and um, posing a question to answer uh, issues um, on that site. Then there is um, academic or research archaeology, in which uh, researchers have um, different uh, questions about human evolution or human um, changes in the past and lives. And they find sites in which they can um, pose those questions and try to answer their uh, uh, ideas. And thirdly, this, there is a commercial or professional or also known as developer-led archaeology, which is what I'm doing at the moment. And it starts with somebody wanted to build something somewhere. So there's a building proposal, then we do the site investigation, and then we decide what questions we can ask to that specific site. And this either leads to planning permission or to the schedule monument in which uh, nothing is built and the uh, evidence is preserved. Next slide. I am certain many of you will be aware of this, but I would like to just briefly mention that the, even though the most popular side of archaeology is what happens during fieldwork, um, particularly during excavation, there is much more to archaeological work. Most of this work happens behind the scenes, and uh, there is the comparison to an iceberg. In addition to the desk-based investigations before any fieldwork investigation takes place, a lot of the work for many archaeologists is actually in post-excavation. In environmental archaeology, in the commercial uh, archaeology environment, this post-excavation process is, is undertaken in two stages. First, there is an assessment stage in which we assess the nature of the evidence we have recovered and what can be used for. And lastly, there is an analysis stage in which we undertake whatever studies we had recommended at the assessment stage if we had recommended any, which is not always the case, and we publish our results in the proposed format. This could be a book, an article, etc. There are two types of post-excavation specialists, largely grouped into artifact specialists who study pottery, flint, and environmental archaeologists who study environmental remains or ecofacts. These are bones, seeds, charcoal, insects, mollusks, etc. So going with a bit more detail into archaeobotanical remains, the remains of plants, this can be distinguishable between micro-remains and macro-remains. 
micro remains are those that are invisible to the naked eye and need very powerful microscopes to be able to be studied. Micro remains are visible with the naked eye, but you still need a low power microscope for a study. Um, the microbotanical remains are of different kinds and they are studied for different purposes by different specialists because they have different preservation pathways and survive in different conditions. So for example, pollen grains, which are produced by plants for reproduction, this is the, um, these are studied by palynologists and are used in landscape reconstructions. However, pollen does not survive well, well in soils with basic uh, pH and different plant species produce different amounts of pollen. So everything um, is not necessarily comparable. Diatoms are unicellular algae and they are studied to reconstruct wetland environments. Star terrains are microscopic and found in uh, cells contained in underground plant parts, such as tubers and roots, and they are released when these are cooked. In archaeology, they can be found in pottery vessels, for example, that have been used to cook food, and they therefore inform about plant use for food. Phytoliths are silica bodies found in, found in leaves and stems of plants, and they are released when the plants are broken down or processed. So in archaeology, they are very useful when they are found in instruments used to the preparation of uh, food. Macroontanical remains are, on the other hand, the ones that we can see with the naked eye. So for example, wood, seeds, cones, bone, bone pots, roots and tubers, capsules, chaff, thorns, and berries. Um, many of these are not preserved unless there are specific uh, uh, conditions. So for example, berries are only preserved when we have um, very specific uh, fire temperatures in carbonized uh, deposits. So yeah, these macro remains are found in three, three different types of um, conditions, carbonized, waterlogged, or mineralized. Mineralized uh, deposits are the ones in which um, a lot of organic matter allows to the replacement of phosphate into the organic matter. Carbonized remains are produced when um, items get into in contact with fire, but they are not uh, so close as to get completely burnt. And waterlogged is when uh, sites are underwater. There are two main uses of the data produced by environmental archaeology and different types of remains are more suited for each other of the purposes than others. So one is the obvious, it's um, so it's by the name and it's reconstructing, reconstructing the uh, past environments where humans lived in the past. Uh, all these images here are examples of uh, parallel environmental reconstructions produced by the graphics team at Wessex Archaeology after the environmental archaeology team have undertaken their studies. And an equally important um, purpose for environmental archaeology is the study of how humans used and interacted with their environments and their natural resources. In the case of plant resources, this is known as paleoethnobotany. And within uh, paleoethnobotany, one of the main aims is studying paleo diet. However, there are other subjects of investigation, such as the use of fuel or the use in technology, for example, basketry or textile production. Um, how can we know when plants have been used for uh, food in the past? Well, we need to look at um, bodies, uh, for example, preserved in, in box. And here we have a very good example, but that's very rare. So most of the time we are dealing with um, carbonized seeds. Uh, we sometimes study remains adhered to pottery, but we also sometimes study poo or uh, carbonized uh, fruit fragments as if in this fragment of um, bread. We also need to be very careful about the um, uh, potential accidental pathways of introduction of plants into the archaeological record. So for example, uh, seeds with spikes may be transported by clothes or fur of animals into settlements. And also uh, seeds uh, transported by the wind or seeds that grow, plants that grow into in crop bins and are transported accidentally as collected in, in the crop. Um, I would like to introduce some of the environmental team at Wessex Archaeology and explain what we do. So you've already met Jenny earlier, who works processing samples and preparing them for study. 
Um, here is Nikki, who you will meet later, and looks at the floods from the samples processed by flotation and source the environmental materials contained in them. After that, I study the plant macro remains, mostly seeds and fruits, and I, I undertake their identification with the help of a reference collection of modern seeds, then interpret the data and produce assessment and analysis reports that often end up being part of uh, larger publications by Wessex Archaeology. I would like to speak a little bit about my background, as this has some influence in what I'm going to speak today. Um, I started in academic or research archaeology and spent some years in university studying the plant exploitation activities uh, by the last hunter-gatherers and the first farmers in the Atlantic coast of the Iberian Peninsula. For that, I studied plant remains from Mesolithic and Neolithic sites in Spain and Portugal, and I was involved in all stages of the process, from sampling to full analysis. I also collaborated in other projects with similar research ob objectives, for example, the first farmers in Syria and the first settlers in the Balearic Islands, which were also the first farmers. During my research, hazelnuts ended up having a massive importance, and I designed some experiments to better understand the significance of hazelnuts in archaeological sites. You will see later that I insist on speaking about hazelnuts a lot. So now that we know how um, archaeologists study the remains of plants in archaeology and what we do at the Environmental Archaeology Department at Wessex Archaeology, let's go back to the original topic of plant domestication. Plants have been domesticated along the history of humanity in different areas of the world and at different times, but most of the domestication events seems to have occurred broadly about 12,000 years ago, or 10,000 Cal BC, in several centers of domestication we don't know how long the process of domestication lasted. For some authors, it was fast, uh, a matter of a few generations, and for others, it spanned several millennia. Uh, we don't really know the reasons why plants were domesticated, and there are all sorts of explanations brought forward by different researchers to explain this process. Some think it was intentional, and other think it was accidental. Some mentioned climatic change and environmental pressures, others social and economic reasons. Uh, the beauty of archaeology is that we don't know many other things, so that's why we keep doing um, archaeology. Anyway, this simple single topic has been the object of many long books, and we are not going to delve into this now. Just have a look at the main domestication centers in the world of uh, plants and animals. Um, now, going back to Britain, even though humans have been using and managing wild plants in Britain since the beginning of human occupation, there are no plants domesticated in British land. All domesticated plants that we have in Britain have arrived from elsewhere in several waves of arrival. So first, we have uh, domesticated plants arriving with the forest farmers in the Neolithic, that's about 6,500 6, years ago, and they brought uh, mainly cereals and pulses. There are other minor introductions of foreign plants in between, but the next big introduction of um, uh, plants was by the Romans, who brought um, figs, for example, or citrix, pine nuts, grapes, uh, walnut, and other fruits. Then in the Middle Ages, there is cultivation of other plants that have been in cultivation in Europe much earlier, such as rye and oats, and some exotic introductions by a continental trade. The, they, in Europe, they were receiving uh, products from other parts of the world, world thanks to the Islamic trade. So, for example, watermelon, uh, melon, and dates, or also through the Silk Road trade, rice and sorghum. In modern times in Britain, there is maritime contact with the East Indies, and they were bringing pepper, nutmeg, and other spices. And finally, the introduction of products that are, are not staples happened only after the colonization of America. Uh, these brought maize, maize, potato, tomato, beans, etc. So we are going to focus on the prehistoric or Neolithic arrival of domesticated plants. These crops mostly arrived from uh, uh, Southwest Asia, where they were domesticated in what was traditionally known as the Fertile Crescent area. The cereals that were uh, domesticated there include barley and several species of wheat, such as emmer, einkorn, breadweed, macaroni wheat, rivet wheat, and spelt. The pulses include a garden pea, chickpea, broad or fava bean, 
lentil, bitter bread, and grass pea. And also we have a um, oil plant uh, flax. The date in which these plants started to be uh, domesticated is very debated, but um, some were earlier than others. Uh, in general, they think that all of them were domesticated by the 7,000 uh, Cal BC or about 9,000 years ago. By the 5,000 Cal BC or 7,000 years ago, secondary crops were domesticated. These first evolved as weeds and then the domesticated, uh, maybe accidentally or maybe intentionally, we don't know. Um, and the most important ones are the cereals, rye and oats. Other plants that have a minor presence in Britain's history and um, were domesticated at the time, um, we don't need to mention them in detail, but they are gold of pleasure, lupin, fenugreek, or Spanish betchling. Um, as well, I would like to men mention briefly that there are other domestications that took part in Europe, mostly in Mediterranean Europe, <clears throat> such as opium poppy, grape, fig, and olive. And other cereals were being cultivated in Central Europe in the Bronze Age, and we don't really know where they were domesticated, such as uh, common or broom corn millet and foxtail millet. In addition to all these domesticated cereals, pulses and other herbaceous plants, humans have also domesticated trees. However, the study of the domestication of trees is much more complicated because of the way in which domestication is produced. Uh, this is by grafting or transplantation, but it's very difficult to observe it uh, through morphological changes in the remains that we find in archaeological sites. And also, wild trees cross-pollinate with domesticated trees, so even genetics is not necessarily helpful. Uh, this is, for example, the case of pears, apples, plums, cherries, etc. Many of these appear in uh, British, British archaeological sites, but we cannot know with certainty if they were domesticated or not, and um, we can assume that they were managed species only. Again, I, this, this is a very, very complicated um, uh, topic, and I cannot go into detail. So with all this happening in Southwest Asia and Europe, we know that domesticated plants start to appear in different parts of Europe in the early Neolithic. In some locations, this is 8,500 years ago, but in Britain, domesticated plants do not appear until maybe 5,500 5, years ago, which is the British early Neolithic, a bit advanced, because there are other signs of Neolithic uh, way of life, such as pottery of, or domesticated animals that start appear, appearing earlier, so 6,000 years ago. So we ask ourselves, why does it take so long for domesticated plants to arrive in Britain? Or, or is it just that it's recorded late in archaeology? And how do the domesticated plants arrive? Are they brought by people or are they just traded with people? And when do they arrive first? Is it through the British Channel or is it through the coast? Um, how do domesticated plants spread around Britain? Is it uh, just a few number of people who arrived in uh, Kent, for example, and then they travel through the um, uh, interior lands, or do they go coast hopping uh, around the uh, island? All these questions are questions that researchers often debated, uh, debate heatedly because the data is scanty and um, the theoretical views are conflicting. We have many problems to answer these um, questions. So, that's why there are many hypotheses going on. So the problems are many Neolithic sites do not have remains of domesticated plants. Also, many Neolithic sites have not been sampled to see if they have remains of domesticated plants. Many Neolithic sites we have domesticated plants have not been radiocarbon dated, so we don't know how old they really are. So what can we do about it? Well, it's basically get more data. At Wessex Archaeology, I have been lucky to be involved in the study of a series of sites with early evidence of cereals that allowed to provide with some data to understand the early Neolithic and the adoption of cereal domesticates across Britain. I will first take you on a tour to Japton and Langethne, two early Neolithic sites that have been analysed and the publications are in the process of completion. And then we will visit Bulford, Lark Hill and Blake Hill which have been assessed and are awaiting further study. 
So I hope to be able to uh, obtain further exciting data from them in the near future. So we are traveling first to a site in Japton, West Sussex, where a solitary archaeological feature was discovered in late 2018. The feature doesn't look very exciting. It's almost certainly a tree throw hollow. So basically, the hollow left by a fallen tree. Within the hollow, cultural material and debris have been deliberately deposited. This comprised an unusually large quantity of uh, early Neolithic pottery. So this is 912 thirds from a minimum of 17 uh, vessels, over 1,000 pieces of work flint, and a particularly rich and varied assemblage of environmental remains. This is a picture of one of the flints. It's just four centimeters long, but we don't care about flints. So the environmental evidence provides important evidence for activity during the period, which is otherwise extremely scarce in this part of the country. The environmental evidence was mostly preserved by carbonization, although remains of small animal bones were also preserved on one sample. The cereals include wheat and emmer was identified, but also barley and some cereal grain fragments that I couldn't identify because they were uh, very badly preserved. One of the emmer grains was radiocarbon dated as early Neolithic, and the date was 3,900 uh, years cal BC. Other char plant remains present were hazelnut cell fragments, seeds and fruits of a crab apple, apple or pear, seeds of veggies and dog or sorrel, and deadly nightshade. The natural uh, fragments in two samples from the middle field, so mostly post breakage carbonization and were of a small sizes. Um, what does it mean? Uh, basically, according to my experiments and others uh, from other people, this type of fragmentation suggests that the hazelnuts were first cracked open, the kernels eaten, and then the cells discarded. This may sound quite obvious, but we will see later that this is not always the case necessarily. Dog beds and nightshed seeds could have been growing at the site and the seeds accidentally charred. However, dog and bed seeds are almost ubiquitous in archaeological uh, assemblages and deadly nightshed is very rare. This plant is poisonous and in control amounts it can be used for hallucinogenic and medicinal purpose. We cannot prove that that was the use back then, but it's an interesting possibility. Now we travel to Clangethny, site in Anglesey, North Wales, where Wessex archaeology did excavation in 2017. The site didn't look very promising to me with some Romano-British remains, like this post hole structure. However, there were two groups of pits, one with 11 and another with three pits. And they didn't have any artifacts or they have very little but seemingly prehistoric flint and pottery. Unfortunately, some of the pits were truncated by later Roman activity, but um, the island of Anglesey is rich in Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments, such as um, stone circles and standing stones, but there is a small number of settlements uh, belonging to the Neolithic identified. So in addition to the pottery and flint from this site, the assemblage uh, it comprised a very interesting um, uh, amount of charred plant remains. The material was dominated by well-preserved hazelnut fragments. One fragment had an insect hole, which for me this is exciting, and occasional kernel fragments, and a small number of other items, including cereal um, remains. So for example, emmer was the only species positively identified, and there were other wild plant seeds, such as grasses, and um, fruits such as elder and uh, unidentified fruit mesocarp, uh, plum cherry, and a stone from Hawthorne. Analysis of the hazelnut cell following uh, parameters based on experiments, I concluded that the whole nut carbonization is a likely explanation for the origin of this assemblage, so whether with some degree of carbonization of fragmented nut cell. What does it mean? Uh, well, it means that the hazelnuts were cracked open, the kernel is eaten, and the nuts are discarded, as well as some of the hazelnuts that were carbonized accidentally while they were being roasted. Um, we undertook radiocarbon dating on a number of char plant remains from these pits, obtaining early Neolithic results. These are comparable to the data uh, obtained from other two sites 
with early Neolithic cereals in Wales, uh, Gary Cottage in, south, in the southwest uh, Wales, and another site in northwest, both in the coast. Does this suggest arrival by uh, coastal hopping? We don't know, but the information is too scanty yet, but it's an interesting um, suggestion. Now we travel to the Salisbury Plain, where Wessex Archaeology have been excavating some sites to make space for lots of army houses. Uh, one of the sites, Bullford, have an important double hinge monument from the Bronze Age that led to the area being declared a scheduled monument, so no planning permission was given. On the left, there is a reconstruction by Wessex Archaeology graphics team of how the monument would have looked in the Bronze Age. Unfortunately, the environmental evidence from the monument is not very exciting, uh, but what's really exciting for me is the evidence from the Middle Neolithic bits under, that means older than the monument, which you can see in the picture here on the right. Uh, can you guess what the um, pits had? Hazelnuts. So yeah, they had some cereal grains. Many turned out to be medieval. That's why it's important to radiocarbon date them. But um, they also had lots of uh, remains of fruits, such as crab apple, but more importantly, hazelnut. Again, this shows the importance of uh, complementarity between wild plant use and cereals among the first farmers. So the pits have some uh, cereal grains, many turn out to be medieval, that's why it's important to radiocarbon date them. But also they had remains of fruits, such as crab apple, but more importantly, hazelnut. This shows the importance of complementarity between wild plant use and cereals among the first farmers. However, for me, the most important part are the hazelnuts. We have lots of kernels in addition to many nut cell fragments. And based, there are many reasons uh, in which uh, plant remains get carbonized. And the authors disagree on the importance of nut cell fragments in archaeological sites, but no one disagrees that they must have a lot of importance uh, the kernels might have had a lot of importance. So kernels only survive in very special carbonization conditions. This makes this deposit really, really special and a rare example of its kind. I have only done the assessment so far and will hopefully be undertaking the full analysis soon. In the meantime, I can advance some of my interpretations. I am quite confident that some of the pits were possibly used in roasting of hazelnuts, and one of my colleagues, Andy Soul, who's a field archaeologist, has done this lovely model to represent the process. The whole hazelnuts are deposited in a pit lined and covered with sand, which is uh, good for heat conduction, and their fire is made on top. This is backed by many experiments and is successful in roasting a lot of hazelnuts in one go, with some of them being carbonized accidentally. And why would people roast hazelnuts? Uh, well, there are several explanations, but one is potentially for long-term storage. And roasted hazelnuts can last for several months, but it, it's also a good um, strategy to improve the flavor. Improve the flavor. Um, any of these, at any rate, suggest that uh, hazelnuts were an important resource. We briefly move to another site in the Salisbury Plain, which has become famous for an early Neolithic causeway enclosure, which is a rare type of monument in which there are limited example, examples countrywide. Again, this was a monument preserved in situ, but the most important evidence for me, it wasn't the material from the monument, uh, but from the late Neolithic features around. In particular, we found this uh, beaker pot which used to contain uh, chromatic human remains and had imprints of cereal in the matrix, as you can see in the example of barley grain. Mm, I would like to conclude our trip on a site in Hampshire, Blake Hill Quarry, where Wessex archaeology have been undertaking excavations for a number of years. We don't have ready carbon dates yet, but the pottery suggests prehistoric deposits, and I am convinced that the environmental evidence corresponds to that of typical of fur farmers, where there is a clear complementarity between wild plant use and cereals. You can see here some pictures of cereal grains, emmer wheat on the left, barley on the right, and hazelnuts in the middle. I hope to be able to analyze the hazelnuts soon. As in other sites of Neolithic and Bronze Age chronology, in addition to hazelnuts, there were other remains of fruits that were probably consumed and would have had an importance in the diet. 
This is, for example, slow or black thorn and crab apple. The reason why these fruits are carbonized is not clear, but they could have been accidentally charred while being roasted. Roasted would have reduced their natural bitterness and made them more palatable. palatable. But it would also have dried them and allowed them to store them in the long term. It is relatively frequent when we find any of them to find crab apple or apple cuts in uh, cut in halves, and we think that based on ethnographic and experimental evidence that they were precisely cut in half for uh, being roasted. However, in this case, hazelnuts and other fruits are not the only reason for my enthusiasm with this site. This site has a large deposit of charred acorns. Although in nature they are similarly abundant and the ethnographic evidence suggests they could have been as important as hazelnuts, uh, the remains of acorns in archaeological sites are much rarer. Because this deposit is so abundant, I am hoping to be able to interrogate it very thoroughly. Contrary to hazelnuts, which can be eaten raw, acorns need to be roasted because they have lots of tannins. Uh, and I sympathize immensely with the uh, prehistoric person responsible for this assemblage. I'm always having cooking accidents and burning my lunch accidentally. So we have to end this tour through uh, some Neolithic sites that I have been working on recently. My experience is that working in commercial archaeology sometimes limits our possibilities as researchers because we are dealing with um, uh, sites that are very, very interesting, but our time is strictly measured, or because we cannot choose where we want to dig. However, little by little, we contribute with nationally, nationally important data that allows to clear the mist on important issues in human history, such as the first farmers in Britain. Um, with time and through the um, uh, supra-regional perspective, some patterns are observed, all these data collected at the site level will eventually become part of the corpus of information that uh, users of big data will use to analyze trends in human history and will lead to important discoveries in archaeology. I would like to thank all my colleagues at Wessex Archaeology for the fieldwork, um, from the fieldwork teams to the post excavation processing team. Without any of them, this work wouldn't have been possible. And thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this talk. Thank you so much for that, Inez. So this is now your chance to ask us some questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in both Inez and my colleague Fiona, who are going to be able to contribute to answering the, some of your questions. So I'll pull them in now. And this is the time to stick your questions in the questions box. Is anything we've discussed that you want to discuss further? So, Fiona and Inez, are you there? Hello, yes. Hello, we have Inez. Hello. Hi, uh, Fiona. Excellent. Um, Fiona, uh, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself and talk about a little bit about your role at Wessex? Yeah, um, I'm Fiona. I'm up in the North Office in Sheffield. And if you saw the, the earlier session, I'm very similar to what Jenny does. I do kind of the processing and I do some of the microscope work as well. Thank you very much. And Inez, thank you for your talk earlier. That was lovely. Thank you. We've had some questions come in already. Uh, the first question is, what are diatoms? Uh, can, and what can they tell us about the environment? Um, are they fossilised? How does it work? What are they? So diatoms are unicellular algae and they are preserved in waterlogged deposits. Uh, they are usually studied to, um, sorry, yeah, analysed to study how the water, wet environments were in the past. So we only find them in deposits where we have permanent waterlogging conditions. So for example, and, in uh, uh, coastal environments. Uh, okay. And uh, Peter is asking, and Peter was with us this morning as well, he's saying, why hazelnuts? Um, and I know you have a particular penchant for hazelnuts, but what environmental factors 
made hazel trees so prevalent or is it just that the hazelnuts survive better what why do we find why are they so useful and why do we find them well there's a there's a big discussion about this and some people think that actually they weren't so important because it's just um uh, this differential preservation uh, the, the, the cell is very resistant and it's preserved much better than anything else but actually there's lots of evidence that suggests that even though they were abundant and they have more chances of being preserved, they are also um, important in, in, in subsistence. So there are these people who have called it also a hazelnut economy in the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. And um, yeah, they, they, it, it was an available resource that had lots of quality. So for example, it could be stored for several months and it could be available during the winter where other resources were scarce. So it's a, um, yeah, I love hazelnuts, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as my right in thinking, was part of your PhD hazelnuts? Yes, well, yeah, I studied the exploitation of plants by uh, humans in uh, the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. So yeah, uh, it was impossible not to deal with hazelnuts because they, they are the most important resource in both types of um, uh, yes, periods. I see, thank you. Um, uh, let's just have a look at the next question. Uh, so Anne is asking, this is interesting, was hazelnut in a sufficient abundance to be able to grind it into any kind of flour? Um, do we have any evidence for that? Uh, I think um, hazelnuts are a bit difficult to grind because they are very, um, um, I don't know how the word is like mushy, but um, certainly acorns, there's evidence of acorns being uh, made into flour. And that's one of the um, the main uses, just um, based on the ethnographic evidence of uh, people who are still uh, hunter gatherers, or they have been recently, and um, in other parts of the world, and they roasted the acorns and they made them into um, flour and they were baked. And thank you for that, um, Fiona. A question for from your part of the country, um, up north, prehistoric, Neolithic, Northern Britain. Um, is there any environmental evidence to suggest communication with Scandinavian countries? Do we know of any of that thing like that going on? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I'm sure there was. I mean, certainly at the time, there's more kind of coastal movement of people than across land. But I think Innes probably knows more than me when it comes to prehistory as a rule anyway. So I might actually pass that on to her. Um, yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not aware of any clear evidence in prehistoric times. Um, I don't think the evidence is uh, uh, sufficient to support it yet, but for example, there is a case that we've done in uh, Wessex. We've investigated a wreck uh, that was found in the coast of Kent, and the um, one of the uh, evidence that we found in the wreck was a pollen grain of, um, oh, well, I, I forgot the common name, the Latin is Pisia. Um, <laughs> um, and this tree doesn't grow in the UK, and so basically it showed us that this vessel uh, that was wrecked in the coast of Kent actually uh, travelled to Scandinavia. Wow, so it could well have come from um, being being traded then? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And kind of on that note, uh, Margaret is asking, um, she's mentioned evidence of um, some opium seeds which were found in Loch Tay in the detritus on the Loch floor. Where would opium seeds have been or traded from? Are they the same as poppy seeds, or is opium different to poppy? Um, we have um, uh, so opium poppy was domesticated in in the Mediterranean area. Um, we have natural uh, native species of um, poppy available in this country, but it doesn't seem to be the domesticated species. So yeah, if it was definitely the domesticated one, it would have been um, traded from Europe. Wow, okay. And we've got some questions um, about diet. Uh, so the first question is, in prehistoric Britain, would the calorific value of eating solely a plant-based diet have enabled people to survive? And to what extent did they have to subst or add meat to their diet to in increase the calories? And also on that note, what was the average daily menu of a Neolithic person? Um, and do we have any evidence to suggest were they having more than one meal a day? 
or, or is you know is a meal something that's a cultural creation was it more kind of eat as you went along do we have any ideas i think that's a bit um yeah that's one of the things in which we don't have enough data yet but um there's a the, the ethnographic evidence on based on um modern hunter gatherers and early farmers so yes that's uh, there isn't a single way in which you can eat or people should have eaten in the past and there is a different um healthy proportions in which plants and meat uh resources would have had um an input so it could be from anything like 25 percent plants to 75 percent it's really variable okay um and so another question kind of building on that if the cereals came from the south is there any evidence that crops failed in our climate um and do we know we know that farming came am i correct in saying farming came later people started off as hunter gatherers and then farming was introduced later on so after farming was introduced did, do we have any evidence of crop failures and famine yeah um, it's again it's a bit unclear yet but there is uh, this seems to be the case so in the early neolithic there we find lots of well i wouldn't say lots but several um large assemblages of cereals uh and then in the middle and late neolithic up to the bronze age they are rare in archaeological sites so some people suggest that this is because actually farming failed but there are other options that could be um, perhaps behind it so we really need to get more data to be able to um, answer this uh, properly and i think it's worth saying that um we keep a lot of evidence for future research because there's techniques even available today that weren't available 20 years ago so the part of our remit as a company is to keep stuff for the future is that a fair thing to say yes yeah yeah definitely. Fiona, do you want to expand on that a bit? Yeah, uh, just because science is ever changing in all areas of science, including archaeology. So even when we've done up until the point where we can or want to, it's things are then stored carefully. And then years down the line, we might need to bring them out for something else to be done on them. Um, new techniques or refined techniques um, to get more information to help us understand a bit more. Thank you. Um, and uh, Colin is asking, uh, were cereal crops a staple? Um, because of course now cereal is very much a staple in our diet, um, but at what point do we see cereal crops becoming more prevalent and therefore we assume a, a more staple part of people's diet? Again, they, um, yeah, difficult question, but very um, appropriate. So. It, yeah, that's one of the things that uh, happened, um, and some people consider a wrong turn in um, uh, in um, human evolution, which is um, becoming farmers and introducing cereals and staples. And it's actually interesting that it's been noted in several cases, comparison with hunter-gatherers and then farmers living in the same area. The farmers have um, considerably worse um, health uh, than the hunter-gatherers and that's assumed it's because the, the cereals became staples and their diets um, were less diverse so yeah they, they had a little bit of worse health <laughs> and uh, David is asking specifically about the Neolithic is there a variance between samples found in the north of the UK and the south which would suggest different plant or cultural distribution um i think um so far the evidence from the north is generally scarcer in the neolithic than in the south which suggests that maybe um there was less um take of the uh, farming um, new fashion in a way but i think these pieces are mostly yeah basically similar i would say um we find that difference, notably a difference with um, Europe, for example. So in Europe, they were cultivated a much more um, diverse spectrum of cereals. And in Britain, we only have um, a few of them, probably for climatic reasons. Thank you. And uh, Fiona, do you want, um, Sigrid is asking about the number of people we have working at Wessex and everyone's different specialisms. 
Um, do you want to say a little bit about how the team work? Um, well, up in our office, we've got there's me and my colleague Liz kind of doing all the environmental things. And then down in Salisbury, there's a, a slightly bigger team. Um, and so we get the tend to get the stuff for the northern office sites and then um, we'll work, we'll process them and um, extract the eco facts from them. And then everything invariably ends up within us to have a look at and see what she thinks there is and what it all means. And then we kind of take it from there. There's lots of tables and various bits and bobs to be done. But yeah, we, we kind of we work. Although we are at opposite ends of the country to a point, we very much work together um, to get and, all the information we need. And we, I know we have uh, a pollen specialist here. And Inez, do we um, ever outsource our kind of environmental work or do we have mostly all the people we need in-house to get all the information we need? Yeah, we have, um, we, we have a regular team of external specialists whom we um, call in for doing a special analysis. So, for example, um, I only study seeds and, and fruits, but sometimes we have interest in charcoal assemblages. So we send it to some of our external specialists and they tell us information about the woodland resources that were used for fuel or for specific um, uh, practices such as pottery making or um, combusting and in cones. So we have so a yeah, a regular team of uh, specialists. There's a network of people we can call on. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Rob is asking about evidence for bread making and brewing things involving yeast. Would we see that in environmental evidence? Yes, we sometimes um, find uh, sprouted grains. Um, although it's not necessarily straightforward to find out why the grains were sprouted. This could be accidental, but in some cases we, we think it can be uh, on purpose and part of the Molding process, and that's we can we can find that in uh, barley, which is the the most typical. But we also find it in other uh, types of cereals. And that sort of leads on to Philippa's question, which is um, about environmental deposits within pottery, um, particularly Saxon and medieval pottery. So, can we extract evidence from the pottery about what was cooked or made in them? Yes. Um, so in that case, it's um, normally a microscopic um, evidence, so we don't really see it, but there are ways of extracting um, starches, for example, which I mentioned earlier, or phytoliths, uh, which are basically invisible plant parts, and um, they, if we study them, we can find out what sort of plants were um, cooked in those type of vessels. Thank you. Now, we did say when we did our morning session, we said we were going a bit deeper in this afternoon session. So we've got a couple um, of more complex questions. Um, so this one from Robert again. Uh, what's our view on whether the Mesolithic people were partial farmers in the sense that they would plant fruit and nut trees so they could collect them from the right season, even if they didn't demark the land as being part of a farm? Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. So that's one of the um... The, also the markers of the Anthropocene. So some people say that the Anthropocene and the heavy modification of the um, environment by humans started in the Neolithic, but actually probably started in the Mesolithic. So people already understood how to manage um, wild plant resources in um, specific ways. And um, the problem with that is that the it doesn't produce necessarily evidence that is um, really obvious in the archaeological record, but it's based on um, ethnographic uh, information and um, uh, contextual evidence in archaeological sites, we can seriously suggest that, yes, people were managing the environment in the Mesolithic already. Uh, that's really interesting. So even though they weren't managing farms as such, they were planting things and repeatedly visiting them? Yes, and they could transplant some um, plants. They could also uh, produce uh, burn areas so to increase um, um, the yield in, next, in the next year. Wow. And the, another question, this one's from Margaret, a slightly different tack, this one. For storage of grains, do we know how people were storing grains? Fiona, do you want to answer this or shall I? 
Um, yeah, um, <laughs> I think it's it's changed through time, and obviously people adapt to the situation they're living in. So some you'd get like storage silos, for want of a better way. I can't think of the right word right now. But some would be raised off the ground to obviously keep any moisture away. And I've certainly I've actually excavated at a site way back in my uni years where we think we found evidence of um, a storage area. It was absolutely chock with charred grain that had accidentally been burnt down or, you know, purposely burnt down, we're not sure. But yeah, no, there's definitely archaeological evidence of different types of storage. And um, jumping forward in history a bit, what about the Vikings? Did they contribute anything that we know of um, to our kind of ecological landscape? Um. I th I'm not certain if, they, if it's because of the Vikings, but um, there are certainly some changes in the, the medieval period in, to do with um, crops. So, for example, um, rye and oats, which were already present as weeds, they start to become um, seriously uh, intentionally cultivated uh, uh, crops. So this could be either to do with a cultural uh, uh, interference or in, um, influence, but also to do with uh, poor soils, because these are um, cereal species that are adapted to uh, less uh, productive soil. So it's, it's, it's not really known, known why uh, there is a swap, but uh, yeah, there is it. And um, again, not, not hazelnuts this time, but acorns. Were acorns eaten as food? Were they important as food? And I, actually, I have to admit, I didn't know you could eat acorns. Is that doable? Yes, but they have tannin, so that you need to, you can't eat them raw as hazelnuts, so they need to be um, processed in a way with fire, so either boiled or roasted. Um, and yeah, so the, for example, there's a lot of evidence coming from uh, North America where up to very recently there were uh, hunter gatherers and they will have um, acorns as part of their main, um, well, one of the main um, staples. And um, yeah, so as I said earlier, they can, they can be roasted and made into uh, flour and then baked, but also other ways are boiled. In Spain, for example, in the Civil War, when there was a, a lot of um, poverty and scarcity, there was a um, tradition of having a coffee made of, out of acorns, boiled acorns. <laughs> coffee, you say? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and a clarification question from Sally. She's saying, um, are we saying that all domestic domesticated plants in Britain were imported? And if so, why when, do, or do we have evidence that some were domestic plants in the UK were exported elsewhere? Um, yes, all, all were imported, so I'm not aware of anything being domesticated here. Wow. wow I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that. That's new to me. Um, and Glenis is asking about different types of berries, um, things like windberries and crowberries. When do we start to see the expansion of berries in the UK? Um, the, well, this is probably in the uh, early uh, in the Holocene, so with the uh, warming period. But um, I don't think we find those uh, very often in uh, archaeological sites. We sometimes find them in waterlogged deposits. Um, uh, yeah, it's um, it's more. It's more to do with um, landscape reconstruction than uh, the human exploitation, so I'm not entirely familiar with uh, with that. That's okay. And what about flax? Um, uh, food source or textiles? What was flax mostly used for? Do we know? So there are two um, two uh, main uses of flax. One is textile, and we don't have um, serious evidence for that until the uh, Saxon period in Britain, although in other parts of the world and particularly in, in Denmark, uh, there is uh, earlier evidence. But in this country, um, when we find flax in earlier pe periods than Saxon, we think it's mostly for use of the seed, which can be, it's, it's oil rich, so it can be used for several things like cooking or um, um, lighting, things like that. And um, mushrooms, Robert's asking, um, are there any evidence for mushrooms being cultivated or widely? Of course, we wouldn't know if they were collected in the Neolithic, but any evidence for their cultivation? Um, I'm not certain how it's possible to, I guess, if they are transplanted from their natural habitat 
uh, very very far away they could you could propose that they were um, in uh, in cultivation but actually i don't think there is enough evidence uh, of mushrooms in general in archaeological deposits i know there is a famous site called scarabry um, i'm certain if i'm pronouncing it right but they found some interesting um uh, carbonized uh, or waterlogged um, um mushrooms so that's really interesting and it's a very very rare example so it's not something we see very often no not at all no and um a nice a lovely question to finish on from david um are there any books that you can recommend for people who want to read a bit more or to understand the kind of early plants and seeds in Britain? Yes, um, yeah, uh, I put early on one of the slides of uh, domestication of plants in the old world, but I could certainly provide a list that maybe we can make available um, in our social media uh, later because um, yeah, I could think of a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll add that to my to-do list then. Um, some, if you're interested in receiving some further reading, uh, do you, if you all type the word yes in the question box, um, then we can send you a list of things to read further and also some notes from this session. So if you want to know a bit more or have a list of books, type yes and we'll make sure we send that over to you. Um, just checking any final so david's also asking if we ever run practical skills or training courses um david not at the moment but that's um, something we'd certainly be interested in getting into if you can pop that in the feedback um tomorrow you'll all be emailed a feedback survey so if you pop that on there um that would be really interesting thank you um one last question about beech trees um are, are, are they are native aren't they beech trees they are probably native in the southeast of the country, but not in the remainder. Okay, fantastic. So it, de it depends on what you call na native again, because um, there's been so many changes yeah. in the um, uh, prehistory. So things that were here in the um, um, war uh, warmest periods before the um, uh, um, how do you call it the cold periods. Uh, have disappeared and then they have become introduced later again. So are they really native or what do you call a native tree? It's a bit like complex. people, really. Yes. <laughs> um, and a question about, and I don't know how to pronounce this, is it Orkney beer as a particular type of plant? Do we know when that was introduced? It's a type of grain, I believe. I'm not aware with that, of that, sorry. Not for us, that's okay. Um, Sally, I, we have, bizarrely, we do have an Orkney, or two specialist Orkney staff, um, so I can find out and I will email that to you. So that concludes our question and answer session. We're going to switch our webcams off.